So external rotation, AP proximal humerus and shoulder. And once again, like we talked about, <clears throat> external rotation, hand is turned out. <clears throat> Your epicondyles will be parallel with the image receptor marker in the upper outer corner. <clears throat> so epicondyles are parallel, hand supinated, slightly abduct the arm just a little bit. It's not as important in the um, in the proximal humerus is having the abduction, um, but a little bit is going to be okay. Central ray perpendicular to um, one inch inferior to the coracoid process, relax the shoulders. Um, keep in mind that for the shoulder, um, you may need to center more medial to include the SC joint, more inferior to include the inferior angle of the scapula. So you may be to here with your light field, um, I usually split the jugular notch and then make sure that I have that light field above the shoulder. Um, find the coracoid process approximately three quarter inch inferior to the lateral end of the clavicle. So you're just going to look for your clavicle, feel your clavicle across to the lateral end and then come down. It's going to be about three quarters uh, three quarter inches inferior to that lateral end, you're going to find that coracoid. That's where you're going to center to, but once again, like we talked about, it's going to be more medial, so not at the cor coracoid, a little bit more medial to pick up that sternal clavicular joint. The evaluation criteria. Your greater turbicle is in profile, so we see the greater turbicle in profile here. Your uh, lesser turbicle is here, okay? Um, scapulohumeral joint is centered. Proximal humerus and upper scapula and clavicle are all visualized. Optimal exposure factors. Keep in mind, you're going to open your collimation a little bit more here because you want to see the rest of the clavicle and see that sternal clavicular joint. Most doctors want to see the SC joint and then the inferior border of the scapula which you can see the inferior border right here. We just need to pick up that SC joint. Lateral rotation, once again the dorsal aspect of the hand is against the thigh. You're slightly abducted. You're going to be open to the center of that um, <clears throat> jugular notch. The marker's in the correct spot here, up and out of the way. Um, central ray, one inch inferior to the coracoid process. Once again, we're going to keep in mind that we may need to um, center more medial to include the SC joint and more inferior to include the inferior angle of the scapula. Relax the shoulders and then always expose on expiration. Take a deep breath in, let it all the way out, don't breathe, don't move. And once again on this one, we have the inferior angle of the scapula right here. We're just missing the end of the uh, clavicle, the SC joint. So we're going to open up a little uh, wider side to side to include that um, SC joint. So most doctors want to see the SC joint and the inferior angle of the scapula. And this is for um, internal rotation. So right here we're looking at an ideal uh, position shoulder chest x or shoulder x-ray. You can see your inferior angle right here of your scapula. You can see that you've got the SC joint right here. You're seeing some of those vertebral bodies running right down the image. Um, you've not clipped anything off on the um, lateral side of the aspect you can see your entire clavicle your acromion process your AC joint your coracoid um, right here so this is a well positioned image and this is what most of your doctors your most of your radiologists are looking for right there <clears throat> So the shoulder non-trauma, 
most common projections for a shoulder non-trauma is the um, inferior superior uh, axial, the Lorentz method. This image receptor is going to come into the neck as much as possible. You're going to be angled right here into the axilla. Your angle is anywhere from 25 to 30 degrees, so depending on how um, how much that they can lift this arm, the more they can uh, bring it out here, you're going to be closer to that 25. If that arm is coming down here, you're going to be closer to a 30 degree medial to the axilla. So you want to try to supinate that arm as much as possible, um, 90 degrees away from the body. Um, usually an 8 by 10 crosswise with no grid, um, you're going to use either the uh, cassette holder or the patient's arm is going to hold this corner of the image receptor and then you want to make sure that you're lined up in the center right there as close to the center as possible to image that um, that uh, glenoid humeral cavity so an 8 by 10 is the most common without a grid Uh, your evaluation criteria of that inferior superior axial is the lesser turbicle um, is profiled anteriorly. So here is the greater turbicle. Here's the lesser turbicle. Here's your acromion right there. Here's your coracoid. And then you can see this glenoid humeral uh, cavity right in there. So the humeral head and glenoid fossa are profiled and then optimal exposure factors. You want your shades of gray so you get an optimal image. Inferior superior modifications. So we have the West Point modification. This patient is prone. You're coming still inferior superior but it is a steep angle so it's angling down into that joint instead of um, into that axillary. So your Rayford modification and that Rayford modification is basically this right here where you're, uh, you're rotating that arm as much as possible and by doing that it brings that head out more but everything else is still the same. The cassette is into the neck as much as possible. You're still at that 25 to 30 degree uh, angle into the axilla. It's just showing the head of the humerus a little bit better. Your Clements modification, if they can't lay uh, prone or supine but they feel better, more comfortable laying on their neck, they're just going to raise their arm. If they can raise their arm all the way up uh, as far as create that 90 degree angle, you're going to come in perpendicular to your image receptor. If their arm is coming can't get that 90 degrees and comes down like that, you're going to come in at a little bit of an angle, 10, 15 degrees probably, into that axilla to make that image. This is a superior inferior modification. So you have OID right here and that is fine. What you're going to do is you're going to look for that joint right here and then you're going to angle that tube head it's going to be, once again, anywhere from, um, it could be 10 to 20, maybe more, depending on the size of the patient and depending on how they can get their arm across. You never want that arm, um, you're always going to want this OID right here. So a little bit of OID is going to be good. It helps you to project that joint onto that image receptor. So that's that superior inferior modification. And I think it goes and talks about some of these as we continue along here. So alternate position of the Lawrence, the inferior superior, it's with exaggerated rotation, demonstrate a possible hill sax defect. So keep in mind that, that this um, exaggerated rotation of that arm coming around this way is for that hill sax defect. Okay, um, compression fracture of an articular surface of the posterior lateral aspect of the humeral head, often associated with an anterior dislocation of humeral head. This is important to know 
um, it will help you on a, uh, an exam question. So as you can see here with that exaggerated rotation, you're seeing the head of that humerus better, and that's what you're looking for here because it is the posterior lateral aspect of the humeral head um, where that uh, fracture may occur. So inferior, superior uh, axillary projection, the Clements modification, once again, it's still an eight by 10. It's lengthwise instead of the crosswise, 40 SID. Patient is lateral recumbent with affected arm at 90 degrees to the body. So 90 degrees to the body. Your central ray is horizontal and perpendicular to the image receptor. CR enters the axilla. This is showing an angle. It should not be an angle. It should be perpendicular. Okay. So when they can get this 90 degrees, when they've got the 90 degrees right there, you're going to come in perpendicular. So perpendicular to your IR. So disregard this angle right there. Your inferior superior axial projection, the Clements modification, if the patient cannot abduct the arm to form this 90 degrees like what we talked about, so you're not 90 degrees here, you're you know, 35, 40 degrees, something like that, that's when that angle comes in that 5 to 15 degrees into the axilla. Okay, so right into the axilla, and this is what you're going to image. If you look at your other image, it's pretty much the same. You're just looking at this glenoid humeral cavity right here. You're still going to see um, this should be the, um, the coracoid right here. Your acromion and your clavicle are going to be over here. Your glenoid humeral cavity right there. So if they cannot abduct the arm, cannot abduct the arm, 5 to 15 degrees into that axilla. Uh, PA transaxillary projection, the Hobbs modification for a non-trauma. This here, um, this in red is important. Uh, because it is for the Hobbs modification, bursitis, shoulder impingement, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, tendonitis. Still an 8 by 10. It's going to be lengthwise like your other one. 40 inch SID. Arm is raised superiorly as much as the patient can. You're perpendicular to the axilla and humeral head passing through the joint. So it's a PA position. It's still perpendicular. Um, and you're just entering into that humeral joint um, and then going to project it onto that image receptor. So PA transaxillary, it's a Hobbs modification for non-trauma. It's showing the recumbent position. It's no different than the upright position. Patient is still in the same position. You're still um, perpendicular with your central ray onto your image receptor. Um, the patient is 5 to 10 degrees oblique. And if you look back at this, it's still, this patient also is 5 to 10 degrees oblique. And it puts this shoulder closer to the image receptor. So don't let this here throw you off. Still, the patient's a 5 to 10 degrees oblique. And this is what your image would look like right there. This is your coracoid process right here. Your clavicle comes across to your acromion. So that's what you're seeing right there. Uh, right here, your superior inferior axial projection. Uh, the patient position is seated at the end of the table. They're leaning over the image receptor. Um, so the joint is positioned in the middle of the image receptor. That's why you're going to have this OID right here, but that's okay. You bring your head down, so down, down and away from the image or from the central ray. That way, if, if you're not doing that, you're going to get light field into the head here, and you don't want that. You want the head as out of that light field as much as possible. So you duck the arm to a right angle. If possible, you want to flex the elbow to 90 degrees. So this right here. Uh, is preferred by many techs for ambulatory patients. Be sure to rotate the head out of the way. Decrease the OID as much as possible. 
um, but you are still going to have OID. Uh, most of your patients aren't going to be able to um, make that OID zero um, just because you're not going to be able to get that image receptor into the side of the body and still line it up to the center of that um, joint. So <clears throat> a little bit of OID is your friend when you're doing this. So superior inferior axial projection, uh, it's a lateral angulation, so lateral angulation, so it's off to the lateral side, basically, so it's not cephalid or caudad, it's a lateral angle off to the side. 5 to 15 degrees, it may be a little bit more dependent on your patient. It's towards the elbow, passes through the shoulder joint, so you're still passing through this shoulder joint here. Greater angle may be necessary if patient can't lean very far over. 8 by 10 crosswise non-grid is common. And if that patient can't lean over, so the more they can lean, the less OID. The less they lean, the more OID they have. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Uh, your posterior oblique, so posterior oblique, glenoid cavity is the Gracie method. 35 to 45 degree oblique is towards the affected side. So this is the affected side right here. This side's affected. It is the RPO. So you're going towards the affected side. So your uh, CR is two inches inferior and medial from the superior superlateral border of the humerus. Okay, so you're finding your humerus and your two inches um, inferior, uh, two inches inferior and medial from the superior lateral border of the humerus. So this here, uh, fractures of the glenoid uh, labrum or brim. A bank heart lesion, erosions of glenoid rim, the integrity of the scapular humeral joint, and other degenerative conditions. So keep that in mind for the Gracie method. Uh, 35 to 45 degree oblique, and then your central ray right here, um, two inches inferior and medial from the superlateral border of the humerus. So superlateral border of the humerus right here. So um, two inches inferior, two inches inferior, two inches medial, and then that 35 to 45 degree oblique. So right here is what they're talking about. So you're two inches here, central ray, so here to here. And then your central ray is going right through that humeral and glenoid cavity. So 35 to 45 degree oblique right here for that uh, for the patient to be obliqued. Uh, your humerus and then that scapula right there. So degrees of rotation vary depending on how flat or round the patient's shoulders are. Having a rounded or curved shoulder and back requires more rotation to place the body at the scapula parallel to the IR. So keep that in mind. The thicker the patient, basically, the more rotation, so 45 degrees. The thinner the patient, less rotation, so 30 degrees. Evaluation criteria for the posterior oblique glenoid cavities profiled right here, so glenoid cavity without superimposition of the humeral head. You want to see that nice open cavity right there. You don't want that uh, humeral head uh, into that uh, glenoid cavity. Scapulohumeral joint centered, optimal exposure factors. So once again, you want to see that nice open uh, glenoid humeral cavity right there. So we are going to do the tangential projection, the Fisk, me Fisk method. It's the intertubecular groove. Um, this is erect. Humerus, 15 to 20 degrees to central ray, so uh, which is perpendicular to the image receptor. Central ray skims the top of the shoulder, so you're skimming the top of this shoulder here. It's on an 8 by 10 crosswise with no grid, so it's a small image that you're doing. So this is the 15 to 20 degrees right there that they're talking about. 
um, perpendicular with that image receptor and then you're skimming that humeral head. This one is uh, the same thing. It's the tangential projection, intrabecular groove, supine, where this one here is considered erect. This one is supine. So you can see your light field here is skimming that image and you can see just the top of the shoulder right there. So 15 to 20 degrees posterior to the humerus, central ray skims uh, the top of the shoulder, okay? And then this is what you're looking at. So your evaluation criteria of this, you're seeing that intertubecular groove, the lesser groove right here, the greater turbicle, this is the greater turbicle, this is your lesser turbicle, lesser turbicle, and then this is that groove, that bicipital um, groove. The groove is profiled between the greater and the lesser optimal exposure factors. This would be your evaluation criteria for this image right here. And I'm going to stop right there on that. Um, there will be more to follow. There's probably a couple more videos that I'll send out um, tomorrow. Uh, if you have any questions on this, uh, please be sure to jot them down and we will get them covered um, when we come back to this.